The, um, in the enlargement on the gospel, as I was preparing the homily, I found in researching it this statement. It says, the scribe, in saying, truly, teacher, you have said well that he is one. The scribe obviously has not come to Jesus with hostile intent, unlike the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were always attempting to trap Jesus. And nor would the scribe be so quick to affirm Jesus. In restating Jesus' answer, he changes soul and mind. Love the Lord your God with all your soul and all your mind and all your heart. He changes soul and mind to understanding. The Greek word, sunesios, if I'm pronouncing that right. And this conversation takes place in the temple. And why this is so amazing, outstanding, is that the scribe is committed to temple worship. He may have come to the temple on that day to make sacrifice. This gives special weight to his comment to Jesus that love of God and neighbor is more important than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Isn't that amazing? The person who is making the sacrifices in the temple is then able to say to Jesus when he asks, which is the, the first commandment? Not meaning number one and number two, number three, but meaning the one that, that really contains everything else. And when Jesus answers correctly, it, it enlightens the heart of the scribe and says, that's right, that's right. And so you have a heart-to-heart -heart connection you know, between the scribe and Christ that is so different than the adversarial connection it is we normally see existing between the Pharisees and Sadducees. The scribe's comment is key in keeping with the prophetic tradition, which has long emphasized not sacrifice in prayer, but a broken and contrite heart when we pray. Sincerity of soul. Obedience to God, Jeremiah. Steadfast love of God, Hosea. And then the, the one we're very familiar with is the, the doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God, Micah. Remember that? This is one thing the Lord asks of you, O man. This is it. Love, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. So it is unusual for Jesus to encounter a religious official, especially at this point in his priestly ministry, because this gospel is set right in the time after Jesus has entered the temple of Jerusalem in triumph and overturned the tables of the money changers and the dove sellers and made a whip out of cords and drove them out, saying, my father's house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And so it's even more amazing. The scribe comes to Jesus and says, what's the greatest commandment? The other ones have said, by whose authority do you do this? And give us a sign that you have authority to do this. So this is a very unique um, and very, very special interaction between the tender of the sacrifices in the temple and Jesus, the overturner of the money changers' tables in the temple. The... Uh, when Jesus sees this, when he sees the man's understanding, the Greek word synesios, um, he says that this man is not far from the kingdom of God. Now, this Greek word synesios, I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to look it up. We, you know how they say it's all Greek to me? Well, <laughs> I, I came along young enough that we didn't have Greek. We had Latin and we had French. We should have had Spanish. The... Uh, um, so I didn't get a chance to you, you go to Google and you say, how do you pronounce this? So all you Greek scholars out there, please forgive me. Uh, but if I'm unable to pronounce it correctly, what I want to share with you is what this, this word means. And it, it can be used, in, for instance, in, in Homer in the Odyssey, it's used to describe a running together, a flowing together as of two rivers two separate things coming together. We could actually say something more colloquial would be connecting the dots instead of connecting the rivers. And so this connecting of the habit of adherence to ritual and worship 
our ritual in worship is meant to serve or instruct or inform the worshiper. That's why we have the scriptures. That's why we have the lessons. That's why we have the sermons. That's why we have, you know, the, the rising and the kneeling and the bowing. It informs the worshiper. And so, but it's separate from the actual obligations to what is demanded by God of the worshiper in their non-ritualistic everyday lived experience. This connecting of the habit of ritual, in other words, the sacrifices in the temple, which is meant to inform and edify and instruct, you know, the worshiper, that's connected then with what is it that God obligates the worshiper to in their daily lives. Remember how at one point Jesus said, if you go to the temple and go and then to offer your sacrifice and there you recall that your neighbor has anything against you leave the altar you know go to your neighbor be reconciled and then come back and offer your gift that's that's really a part of the essential teaching of Jesus is that the two are connected so intimately that we can't come with an injury to our neighbor and offer sacrifice until we have solved that problem. This has to do with the living out of our faith. And this is contra contrasted with one time when Jesus says, these people pay me lip service, but their hearts are far from me. These people pay me lip service, but their hearts are far from me. And of course, lip service means insincere respect, expressed with the lips, but not acted upon. That's, that's the quotation in Matthew chapter 15, verse eight. Their heart is far from me. The, the best example of this that I can think of in terms of the unifying of ritual and the obligation of the worshiper to do the things that God requires the, um, is expressed in Matthew chapter 22. Remember when the, the, the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus and they want to try to put him in opposition to Rome and, or in opposition to the Zealot Party, which wants, you know, a revolution from, you know, from the uh, Roman occupation. And so they, they ask a question. Is it lawful to pay the temple tax or not? Shall we pay it or not pay it? Simple question, you know, but it's got a trick to it. It's sort of like, um, have you stopped beating your wife lately? You know, there's no really good way to answer that. And so what Jesus does is he says, why do you try to test me? You know, show me a coin. So the guy reaches in his pocket and pulls out a coin. And then Jesus says, oh, whose face is on that? And anybody else listening would have said, because obviously a crowd had gathered, would have said face, because any pious Jew could not handle anything that had in it a graven image of a false god. And of course, the Roman coinage was minted with images of the divine Augustus. And so Rome solved the problem of they can't touch the coin to pay the temple tax, and then they can't worship. But if they don't pay the coin to pay the temple tax, then they can't worship. And they said, what are we going to do? They said, let's make a coin that isn't offensive. So they made a coin that had the same value. Um, I mean, today we have, what, Roosevelt dimes and Mercury dimes, right? The, uh, and so it had a candelabra that was used in the temple on one side, and it had a sheaf of wheat, which was the most important festival, the festival of the harvest for the temple. And so when the man pulls a coin out of his pocket, Jesus says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give to God what belongs to God because the man obviously was so impious that he didn't care, money's money, you know, ah, you know, who's gonna look at it? <laughs> God, right? Who's going to examine everything that we do or don't do? God. Do you remember how we had uh, back in the old days when you, you were sinful because of something you did, but then also you were sinful because of something you should have done and didn't do? You know, sins of omission as well as commission. So how do we, you and I, connect these two rivers of thought, connect the dots between our ritual actions devoted to God and our living out of the obligations with which such worship honestly and sincerely entered into commits us to? When we come before the, the altar, 
there always should be this, this examination of conscience. And it isn't just that we, you know, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Remember when you were little, you know, and, and you went through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault? Well, if you're in the second grade, what would your most grievous fault be? Forgetting to feed the dog? I mean, you know. What, but the reality is, as we grow in our understanding of our obligations to God and to neighbor, we have to really think about what would our most serious fault be. And so we really have to convict ourselves, you and I, every time we come to this altar to offer sacrifice. Because if we hear getting ready, you know, to offer, say, oh, wait a minute. You know, I haven't been a very good lover of my neighbor as well. And, and that means we have to also be thinking about, you know, our neighbor is not just the strangers that we encounter on either side of us or as we go about our daily work. It also is our children, our family, our community. You know, what have we left out in seeking a relationship with God, but we haven't developed a relationship with each other? One that illustrates, reflects, and is informed by God's commandment to love one another. Uh, interesting thing here is in Isaiah chapter 12, that's the best example of what constitutes true worship. Uh, Isaiah verse 1 chapter I'm sorry Isaiah chapter 1 verse 12 says when you come this is God talking when you come to appear before me who has required this of you the trampling of my courts bring your worthless offerings no more your incense is detestable to me your new moon sabbaths and convocations I cannot endure iniquity in a solemn assembly I hate your new moons and your appointed feasts. This is God talking to the people who are saying, we're doing this for you. <laughs> he says, bring your worthless gifts no more. You know, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you multiply your prayers. I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash and cleanse yourselves. Remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do right. Seek justice and correct the oppressor. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? You know, this is really hellfire and brimstone. And it isn't, you know, you have sinned, you know, in your own heart. This is you have sinned against others. You know, lots of times, when you go to confession, really, I mean, don't you tend to really think of all the things that, you know, you did in your heart, the things that you said, the stuff you did, I missed mass, I lied, I cursed, I... You know, took the Lord's name in vain. The, uh, but what about those larger relationships that are really, when we get to stand before the pearly throne, I'm not sure that God is going to say, I see here that you took my name in vain. Um, wait a minute. Hmm. Can't believe this. Were you always having such a bad day that you had to curse me? I don't think that's going to be the biggest thing on his mind. I think he's going to say is, I gave you the gift of life. I put a heart in your body to love with. And what did you do with it? You hated people. You were selfish. You never were generous. You took everything for yourself. You ignored your needs of your wife and children and your neighbor and your community. I really think God's going to be more upset about that stuff. And I think some of the things that we had my fault, my fault, my most grievous fault, I think a lot of those things are human failings that you can try a whole lifetime to never do and you're still going to fail at erasing them. And that's why the journey to holiness is something that takes some real connecting the dots, which is what this uh, scribe did when he asked Jesus, what's the most important thing out of all the stuff we're supposed to do? And he says, there's one thing and then there's something else that's really close to it. Those two make it all up. They comprise it all. And then the light bulb goes off, and the guy who's been offering the sacrifices says, you're right, all this is empty if it doesn't have this other thing attached to it. And then Jesus says, you're close to the kingdom of heaven. Do you know that, don't you? Someplace we probably want to be as well. <laughs>